is mine. Great singing. Please be seated. All right, let's take our Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of Galatians once again. Galatians chapter number 5. Speaking to a large audience, Evangelist D.L. Moody held up a glass and he asked, How can I get the air out of this glass? One man shouted from the crowd and said, Suck it out with a pump. Well, Moody replied, Well, that would create a vacuum and then it would shatter the glass. After numerous other suggestions, Moody just smiled, picked up a pitcher of water and filled the glass. There, he said, all the air is now removed. He then went on to explain that victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by sucking out a sin here and there, but by being filled with the Spirit. Since the day we got saved, God has given us a great friend to help us be the people he wants us to be. Of course, we understand from the scriptures He wants us to be like Jesus Christ. He wants us to be conformed to His image. And as a saved person, we have that spirit that lives within us that helps us get to that point or is going to help us along the way. Because He indwells within us, He's able to empower us, transform us, and guide us in our day-to-day life. Now the goal of this series is to understand better the work of that the Spirit does so that we can learn to be sensitive and submissive to Him. Galatians chapter number 5, we're going to pick it up in verse 16. Kind of familiar ground, but we'll be hitting some different things with it tonight. It says in verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Tonight we are going to learn about the impact the Spirit imparts upon a life that is controlled by him. And I think these are very desirous things. I think by the time we're all done, we're, we're going to say, you know what, that's what I want to have coming out of my life. I don't want the, the other garbly goo coming out. But we have to learn what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And that's been our goal. And we'll continue on learning about this kind of stuff as we talk about tonight, tonight what I call the fruit of the Spirit. So let's pray, and we'll get into the service tonight. Father, we're thankful tonight for the study of the Word of God. I pray that your spirit would uh, communicate through me tonight and speak to hearts and, and help us understand what it means to be filled with the spirit and the results of it. They're wonderful things, Father, and I, I just pray that uh, each one of us would seek to be understanding and seek to be sensitive and seek to walk in the spirit as it commands us to do so that the flesh doesn't have control of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned earlier in the series, salvation was a huge turning point in the life of an individual. Now before we were saved, as we understand from the scriptures, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the lusts of our flesh and the desires of our mind, and we really didn't have any power in and of ourselves to please God. Now many think that they are trying to be a good person to earn their way to heaven, but the Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, that all our righteousnesses are as un as filthy rags. In other words, there's just nothing we can do to please God naturally in our flesh. But the day we get saved, some wonderful things happen, and there's a whole plethora of them, okay? And, and, but we're focusing primarily on this one, is the fact that the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell us. God comes to live within. We become a, a, the temple of the Holy Ghost. I like how it mentions in that song, uh, in this temple of clay, how that Spirit dwells within And it is a very, very special thing that God would live in you and me. There is no other religion of any type where the God 
that they worship dwells that closely with its subjects. But, at, but not here with Bible Christianity. We learn that the Spirit comes to dwell within, and, and as a result, we have the ability with His help to live a life pleasing to the Lord and not falling for sin. Now, we will never be sinless, but the Bible tells us that sin shall no longer have dominion over us in Romans chapter 6. In other words, we can actually have literal victory over the sinful tendencies that oftentimes we would fall into and make a mess in our life. Trying to live the Christian life, though, in the flesh is a, is a dead-end road, though. We have to understand that you cannot live this book, you cannot f fulfill the commands, you cannot do it joyfully without the Spirit of God helping you. That's why God, one of the reasons God gave that to us. We need God's help. Living the Christian life void of being filled with the Spirit is just a dead-end frustrating road. It's a life where we, of our own willpower, try to live righteous. You ever hear somebody say, well, I'm tr really trying. What they're trying to do is live the Christian life in their own power. And guess what will happen every time? Failure. Failure. And discouragement and frustration. And it's, and it's a sad thing. Because there, there are God's people genuinely saved genuinely want to please the Lord, but they just don't have any power to do it because they're trying to fulfill the commands of God without the help of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the most vital part of your salvation because He comes in to enable you and I to live out the things that God commands us to live out. But a fleshly-driven Christian they live a life trying to live the commands of God, trying to live righteously in their own willpower. And they often don't have much of a relationship with God. Now, they may look like it on the surface. They may talk the talk, but they don't have much of a relationship with God at all. And what it often leads to is very self-righteous attitudes, sour spirits, and eventual defeat. This is one thing that has really bothered me in recent years is watching people what I call swing the spectrum. And this is what I mean by this. At one point in time, they were here, and then all of a sudden they swing over here. They're, 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 they were right, they were hard right many times. And all of a sudden they come loosey goosey lefties. It's just like they went, they flipped from one side to another. And I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm just saying, what, what happened here? It's the swinging of the spectrum. Usually what it is is that they had a hard right stance on a lot of convictions. Now remember, the Bible says not to turn to your left hand or to your right or to your left. Balanced living. Right stand, right spirit. Right? But hard right, it, it used to be where people thought, well, the more right you get, the more spiritual you were, but actually it ends up being more pharisaical and self-righteous and proud and stubborn and angry and, and just kind of an angry spirit. And you know what happens over time? And I've seen this. I, 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 I used to walk with some of these people, okay? They get real frustrated. They get real bitter. And then they start, well, oh, this isn't working out. And, they, and they're beginning to be very unfruitful. And then they start concluding, oh, this doesn't work. So they swing to the other direction. <laughs> it's like the pendulum. And they become very worldly, very loose. They, they're, they're the ones that are trumping liberty in Christ. And they live unrighteously. All while still acknowledging God as their Lord, of course. But both sides are wrong. They're extremes on both ends living left and living right, when the God says balanced living, you don't add to the scriptures and you don't subtract from it. In Revelation it says that. J Joshua was told not to turn to your right hand or to your left, but to stay balanced and focused. Either one is, either side is fleshly living. It can be that way, but I, I, I've seen this swing and and I, I see churches doing this too, where that once they, you know, they were hardcore this way, then, they're, then they go Lefty Lucy over here, and, and it's just like you don't even hardly recognize them anymore. And it's a very sad state of affairs. 
The, the, and it, it grieves me, especially that side is so proud, but this side is so proud too. It, it, it's both, both ways are. And, and the thing is, it, it's discouraging to me because more are going left right now. And they think, well, no, we got liberty. We can live worldly. We can live carnally. And we, can, we can watch whatever we want to watch. We can dress any way we want to dress. We can, we can behave any way we want to behave. We can listen to whatever we want and still be right with God. And I'm here to say, no, you can't. Because the Bible does command holiness, but he does command graciousness, balance. Balance is what we're shooting for tonight. And you can't live the Christian life balanced without the filling of the Spirit of God. You can't do it. You'll either go far right or far left. Both are wrong. Only righteous living is possible through the power of the Spirit. We have a guest speaker who's been here before, Dr. Terry Coomer. He's going to be here in December. And, and uh, some of you, I've given out some of his books on, on how to walk with God and, and the Spirit-filled life and something like that. And he really, I think, does a great job assessing some of the things because he's a counselor. He's been dealing with things. And, and he's had a lot of people ask questions. You know, here I raised my kids in church. They read the Bible. They memorized all this. They were in Sunday school. They did devotions. And they're living like the devil today. And he puts his finger on something really good. He said they never learned how to have a real passionate relationship with God and what it means to be filled with the Spirit. I, I got a quote from one of his books. He said, one of, most of God's people understand that they cannot work, their, or work for their salvation However, they think they can live in the, the Christian life in their own power by their good works. That is living for the dictates of the flesh or self-righteousness. There are three ways Christians seek to live the Christian life. Unrighteously, the lefty Lucy, if you will. Self-righteous, the righty-tighty, or righteous, the balanced biblical position. Unrighteousness means they are given over to the lust of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life. Self-righteousness means they are seeking to live the Christian life in their power. Do they go to church three times a week or more? Do they read their Bibles daily? Do they pray from a long list about things they want to pray about? The answer is yes to all the above. However, they don't have a relationship with the Lord. They, it's a checklist thing is what it amounts to. Oh, I got that done today. I can say that I've got... And, and they, don't, they read and they get up and they don't even know what they've read. God's never spoken to them. You know, this book is a living book, by the way. God will speak to you and get in the grip of your heart. If you've ever had that happen before, it's, it's amazing when God is real. And, and, and when, when you have a time in prayer where you just, it's just like the heavens are open and there's a clear passage between you and God. It's a wonderful thing. It's more than just outward activity. But it leads to destruction and much pain in their lives and the lives of their children if you go either way. Now we'll get into more details later about having that real relationship with, with God and being filled with the and how it, how it connects with being filled with the Spirit. That's for another message. But I, I want to invite us tonight to see how fruitful this quest really is to be experiencing the fruit of the Spirit genuinely because it, it bubbles out the best of the Christian life in the life of an individual. It really does. What the Spirit produces in a life is transforming and joyous. And that's the way it's supposed to be. The Christian life isn't supposed to be a drudgery. If it's a drudgery in our life, then there's something wrong. We've got to fix that. We gotta go. we, this is a troubleshooting manual, manual right? It's, it's supposed to, it, it tells us what's right and what's wrong and how to fix things. We want a joyous, real Christian existence. And the Spirit's the one that enables that. And may I say, independent of outward circumstances. You know? If we are experiencing, if we are not experiencing that, then it's time to do, again, as I mentioned, some troubleshooting and seek God's wisdom to fix the problem. And tonight we'll see what we can expect to experience when we're filled with the Spirit as we see first off the temperaments. Our text communicates to us that one, what one can expect to possess as far as our temperament goes when walking in the Spirit, or 
as we understand being filled with the Spirit. Paul starts off by telling us, of course, in our passage that we read uh, beyond verses 16 and 17, what the works of the flesh look like. In other words, what a person is like when they're controlled by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, as John mentions in 1 John 2. This is what they look like. Verses 19 through 21, it, it is an ugly, ugly list. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. This is all speaking of immoral and sensual type behavior. And it's not just active participation. It can be mental participation as well. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman to lust after her in your heart, you commit adultery with her already in the heart. So, I mean, we're talking both mental and active, okay? It goes on and, and it says, um, idolatry. In other words, we're putting things ahead of God when God isn't, when we're not filled with the Spirit. We'll automatically do that. Witchcraft. I'll just put it this way. People seek alternate forms of spirituality when they're not connected with God. Because we're naturally spiritual creatures. They'll be looking at, at, at things of other things. We'll be like Saul of Tars. I remember Saul there in the Old Testament. When he couldn't get a hold of God, where'd he go? The witch of Endor. Why? Because we recognize at times in our life where we need help beyond us, and if we're not getting it from God, we'll start looking to other sources. And there's only one other source that's available. It's either God or Satan. Satan just has it in multiple facets. Whatever is the most comfortable for somebody to exist. But that's what will happen. We'll get involved in that. It mentions hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. You know, all these things, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You notice one of the underlying things, too, is a lot of pride and anger. When we're angry, are we filled with the Spirit? <laughs> we're filled with a Spirit, <laughs> but not the Holy Spirit. I know that. Have I gotten angry? Oh, yeah, I've gotten angry before. I can tell you one thing. What does it make me feel? Not very good. I can tell the Spirit's grieved when I feel that way. Now, the Spirit is grieved within me. These are all works of the flesh. This, of course, as it mentions here, is the activity of a lost man, but I also believe it's the activity of a fleshly controlled saved person. In other words, somebody who's not walking in the Spirit, somebody who's not filled with the Spirit, they're going to naturally express these things readily. And the Spirit was given to suppress this and to crucify it, actually, as we'll see here in a moment. Now, for the saved person, if they're living after the flesh, as we might say, the Bible says in Romans 8 that you cannot please God. And you'll be grieving the Spirit, and it'll be very grievous for you. And I've expressed this before. Because the Holy Spirit of God will be sick inside of you, as he would be sick inside of me. There will, there will be any joy, there won't be any peace, there will be a lot of turmoil on the inside, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of those types of things, until we, <laughs> we do some cleansing of our, of our life. And we'll, we'll address that at another time. As Paul continues, though, we learn about what the fruit of the Spirit is. And what a person filled with the Spirit can expect their temperament to be like. And I'll say this. It's not worked up. And that's the, that's the incredible thing. It's not, so, oh, I'm going to try to love. I'm going to try to be joyful. I'm going to have peace. Peace like a river, you know. Some people are just straining. <laughs> I'll be long-suffering. I'll be gentle. You know, it just kind of grit in the teeth behind that, but you know, there's just not a lot there. It's a bit grievous, and it's tough. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. You know, this, this isn't worked up. It's present when the Spirit controls a life. When we are filled that's why it's called fruit, not fruits. You know, sometimes people say fruits. It's like you can have one. No, you either have them or you don't. You either have them or you don't. 
it's one of the ways we can know whether or not we're flesh controlled or spirit controlled. If you know that you're not experiencing these fruits, you can just or fruit, you know that something needs to be fixed. We need to get back under His control because we've turned it off, and it can happen in a moment. And it's our responsibility to recognize it and, of course, get things right. But again, this isn't worked up. It's, again, one of the ways we know whether, we're not, whether or not we are flesh-controlled or spirit-controlled by the traits we possess. It's an all-or-none proposition. Now, the first one listed in this fruit, I believe, sets off the chain of reaction, if you will, that, possess, that brings about this. And the first fruit that's part of the fruit mentioned is love. Love. Interestingly enough, when we are filled with the Spirit, we become very conscious of the love of God for our lives. If you go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, I think Paul here, he, he's praying for the Ephesian Christians there, at the church there. Verse 14 tells us this, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth are, is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. We're talking about somebody who's being filled with the Spirit. He's strengthened by him, enabled, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded, what? In love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye, ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. The thing that transforms us or begins the, the chain effect of the fruit uh, manifesting is the, is the understanding of the fact that God loves us as deeply as he does. That will bring the security of the heart uh, uh, to a position where all of a sudden you've got joy and peace, and you have the ability to be long-suffering, and you have the ability to be gentle and to be good and all these other wonderful things that come out. Brother Coomer mentions in, in, in this same book, he quotes, any person who is filled with the Spirit is going to manifest these characteristics. He does not have to try to or play a part or act out a role. He will just be this way when the Spirit has control of his nature. And all those things mentioned in Galatians 5, you know what, those are kind of desirable, aren't they? <laughs> don't, you, don't you desire to be more loving? Don't you desire to be joyous, and peace, at peace? <laughs> and to be gentle and long-suffering? I mean, I think we all kind of want that, I imagine. But it's the, it, this fruit is a hallmark of, spirit, of a spirit-filled person. It's just this fruit will be manifest. They have the strength to do all those things. To be long-suffering, gentle, good. To have faith. To have meekness, which is humility. To be self-controlled. May I say this just on the side? There's nothing mentioned here about fits of emotional ecstasy. Or anybody rolling around on the floor. Or acting insanely goofy. Or laughing hysterically. Or, being, or behaving weirdly. There, there's nothing like that mentioned, okay? I want, I want to make that clear because we live in a day and age where this, the, the, the idea of being filled with the Spirit means very erratic behavior, emotionally just going in multiple directions. I've known people who've been involved in that kind of stuff and they go from one extreme emotionally to another. They can be extremely happy to extremely depressed. And that's, there's, that's problematic. That's not with a, like being... Filled with the Spirit is all about being just, you know, flopping all over like a fish. One of the words is temperate, right? Self-control. Not out of control. Right. Not out of control. It's about being holy, humble people who possess genuine heartfelt compassion and sense that from their Savior. And only God can manufacture that. Again, you can't, I can't work that stuff up. I've tried. It just doesn't work. I mean, I've tried, tried really hard. And the thing is, you can't willpower that. It's impossible. But it's a pretty awesome transformation. Especially when it happens in a person who 
really didn't hold any of those characteristics. You know, and they used to be very mean, sn snarky, difficult. And when they come sweet and temperate, sociable, it's like, wow, what happened to you? Oh, the Spirit of God happened to me. The Spirit of God happened to me. He filled me. It's a wonderful thing. See, the Spirit is going to help us do something. We go back to our text here. He's going to help us crucify that flesh. And it's something that has to be done on a day-by-day -day basis. Paul said, I die daily, right? And he mentions here in uh, verse 24 and 25, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. See, we can't crucify the flesh. The Spirit of God will help us put it down. That's what Romans 8.13 says. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, which means put to death, same as crucify, the deeds of the body, the flesh, ye shall live. The Spirit's there to help us. That's why it says walk in the Spirit, and ye shall what? Not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If we're not experiencing these temperaments, the goal tonight was to help us understand why. To why? Because there are some sincere people that are struggling. They don't understand why they're not experiencing this. And this is why. This, the flesh is in control. It's dictating your actions and your thoughts. Now the devil's happy to flame all that or fan that flame as much as he possibly can. The goal is that for you and I to learn how to be spirit-filled instead by surrendering to his control instead of the flesh. That's a choice that you and I each have. But we, I want to see secondly what I call the enablement. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Here we see in verses 18 through 21 some interesting things about, again, somebody filled with the Spirit. Here we got, in verse 18, the actual command that's here in the Scriptures. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, there are a lot listed here. What I would call kind of a divine enablement that comes about when somebody is filled with the Spirit. What's the natural consequences? Now, I believe we see in this passage that our lives will be obviously joyful, thankful, and submissive to God and I mean that in the sense that it won't be a drudgery. It won't be a drudgery. I remember trying to live, quote-unquote, right as an unsafe person, especially as I was learning Bible truths and realizing, you know, some things weren't right between me and God. So, you know, I started shedding some stuff, you know, as, a, as an unsafe person. And, and I remember trying to go to church and trying to read the Bible and, I tell you something, it was, it was a bit hard at times. I didn't feel like it at all at times. I just couldn't work myself up into it. The word that comes to mind is grievous. What's interesting, with the Spirit of God dwelling inside of a born-again Christian, commands aren't meant to be grievous. 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous, a drudgery. Okay? Now, a saved person, can, it can be hard, too, if you're not filled with the Spirit, trying to do those same commands in the power of your own will. We talked about that a little bit already. But a Spirit-filled Christian will possess a, gra a heart of gratitude, and it'll be submissive to God's will joyfully. 
joyfully. And there will be an element of a song in your heart. You notice when most people are happy, there's usually some, they're humming a tune of some sort. They're humming a tune. When people are truly joyous, they, they often sing or have a song in their heart. Psalm 40, verse 3, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. So they'll hum, they'll sing. Music will flow, I want you to hear this, that is melodious in nature. Because it says, making melody in the heart. And that's vital. Now this isn't meant to be a, a study on music. I'm going to do that in one of these days in our Y series at 9.30, but I want to address this because it's brought up here. True biblical music is primarily melodious in nature. It's melodious. It's melodious. Music is made up of three parts. If you're not a music major, I'm not either, but I know enough about music to know it's made up of three parts. Melody, harmony, and rhythm. And you need all three for it to work. Did you know that it's also, there, it's also in line with the triune God? The melody is, is related to God the Father, the harmony with the Spirit, and the rhythm with the body, Jesus Christ. You know, God, God's got a stamp on all the creation. Well, there's lots of things in threes. And they're often symbolic of the, of the, of the Trinity. But I, I want to I want to point out here. It says making melody in the heart. Biblical music is not rhythmic controlled. Okay, rhythm is part of music because it drives it forward, but it's not meant to control it and be the driving factor. You know what is rhythmic controlled music? That's devil's music, actually. Because you look at pagan cultures. You, I've seen video clips of all this kind of stuff before. I imagine many of you have too. What do they use to conjure up spirits? Bang, bang. Lots of rhythm. Very rhythmic type things. See, the world's music is primarily rhythmic controlled. You can, you can see that. You can, you can turn on any, any secular type radio station. And it's not hard to understand that. It stirs the flesh, is what it does, the rhythm. I grew up in the world, okay? I grew up in the world. I, I listened to pop music, I listened to country music, I listened to all that kind of stuff. And there's a rhythm that goes along with it that sets an atmosphere wherever it's at. You go to a sporting event, what do they have there? Music designed to get people pumped up. I mean, this is like, this is a no-brainer. You walk into that, and into any arena, and it's got music designed to pump you up and get the crowd roaring, right? What does that? Rhythm. An overabundance of it. That's why you have a lot of bass and a lot of a lot of drum beat that overrides the melody and controls the music. Well, we have had, we've had Bruce Fry here. Bruce Fry grew up in the, or not grew up, but was in the country, western style music, more pop country, for 20 years. And he stood in this pulpit on many occasions and has told us what he experienced amongst that. The control rhythmic music had on the crowds and the way people would respond to it. And he, he, he recognized that even as a lost person. See, the, rhythm, the world's music is primarily rhythmic control. It stirs the flesh. And the reason people listen to it, it gives them a certain feeling. That's what it does. It gives them a certain feeling. Music is not all moral. It's not all moral. That's, 
That's what's argued. Oh, it doesn't matter what kind of music you have as long as it's the lyrics. No, music is more than just lyrics. It is the sound. It is the sound. And the sound is packages a message. You know how many old songs I used to listen to didn't even realize what it was saying until I got saved and went back to them? I was like, wow! I didn't know what I was singing to. <laughs> Some of those things. I was shocked, actually. I'm like, really? I didn't, I had never, and it was like all the immorality, all the different alcoholic, drug, all the different things that I used to, I'm like, I couldn't believe it. What I was listening to. Because that music packaged the message that went by my will and struck a chord in my heart. Is it any wonder that people behave according to the, what, the music that they listen to? That's what happens. Very, you got to be very conscious of this. CCM music, contemporary Christian music, is an attempt to mimic the world's music. That's what it is. It's an attempt. In our text, there is a reason why a spirit for a person makes melody in their heart. It says it right there. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. Melody. The flesh-controlled person prefers something that excites the flesh. The spirit-controlled person will be enabled to possess this kind of thankfulness and joy, interestingly enough, too, despite circumstances that are prevailing in life. And that's what's so unique about it. For most people, happiness occurs when something happens we want. Happening, happiness is, is a result of happenings. However, the spirit-filled person can be joyful, regardless of what they want happens or not. It's very unnatural. But I like what Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, you familiar with this, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, which passeth all understanding. In other words, you don't understand why it's there. It just is. Because the Spirit of God gives it to you. Paul even mentioned in 2 Corinthians 7, 4, Great is thy, my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Can you explain that? I can't. But he knew something about being filled with the Spirit and what it can manufacture in a heart. The only way that is possible is the Spirit's filling. And again, we just can't work that up naturally. The Spirit will help us stay sane, joyful in a crazy and sometimes depressing world we live in when He truly controls us. Well, thirdly and finally, the empowerment. Acts 1.8 Jesus tells the disciples before he heads to heaven, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus tells the disciples that they will be empowered by the Spirit to be witnesses for him. That's true for us too. As we seek to be controlled by the Spirit, God will enable our witness to be effective whether we see anything manifest outwardly or not. We're just the conduit in which the Spirit works through. So it's like we're the glove and the Spirit is the hand, as it were. Because it's the Spirit that convicts people of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Just like he convicts a lost person, he convicts a saved person. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that brings a person to the point of repentance and faith. And I've seen people get under conviction. I've seen them tremble. I've seen them stare down at the ground. I've seen them uh, get mad. Murmur things under their breath. Because of conviction. I've seen people tremble. <laughs> I've seen some people tremble. It's amazing. It's the power of the Spirit of God when it grips a heart. What it does. I've seen people get real quiet because they don't know what to say. And sometimes <laughs> you don't see anything at all. But the Spirit works behind the scenes. 
See, we can't convince or argue people into salvation, can we? You can't do it. Not with pure logic. You can't do it that way. But the Spirit works through our lives to speak to the heart of the lost person. And when the Spirit works, the salvations will be genuine. You don't have to force anybody. You don't have to arm twist them. You don't have to use high pressure tactics. The Spirit of God will just do the work. We just get to be the midwife, as it were. As God's people, we're ambassadors for Christ. We are to be a witness to people. Now, it's good to be able to answer questions. It's good to know why you believe what you believe. But we need the Spirit's power to crack the heart. And whenever we go out in our days, we do outreach, we do whatever, may we just be people who say, God, I need your help (laughs) to touch that heart, to melt that heart of stone, to see them open. We need the Spirit to do that. We can't do that on our own. It's impossible. All we can do is offer ourselves, Lord, just use me and let the Spirit flow through that way. Tonight, this is the fruit of the Spirit that will be present in our lives. As we saw through these different passages tonight, I think it's very desirable fruit. Very desirable fruit. It's, well, it's fruit that will produce genuine holiness in our lives. It'll be fruit that transforms our lives. It is fruit that will enable us to be the people that God wants us to be. It comes down to one thing, submission to Him. Submission to Him. Do we submit to Him or not? And we'll get into that more at another time. But may God give us a heartfelt desire to express these fruits. This fruit, if you will, of the Spirit. Let's stand to our feet for a few moments tonight as the pianist is going to come and play. Tonight, folks, what a thing to desire. To have joy in the heart, joy in the life, power 